Hey now, hey now, this is how you dance in here. Yeah, yeah, this is how you dance yeah. in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is our two month anniversary. That's right, we're celebrating it here at the Little White Chapel. We're here at the Little White Wedding Chapel. Guys, you just sh shot a video here. What was that all about? We got married in this oh, room right. we got two months ago. Right <laughs> this place is famous in Vegas, and we wanted to capture kind of like the strangeness of it with the, the, the topic of us getting married. Obviously, we've seen the comments. Some people are like, aren't they sisters? That's so weird. <laughs> we were working with just a bunch of our friends with literally no budget. I, mean, I think that when you're not given like a hundred thousand dollar budget, it puts you in a situation where you're forced to be even more creative than you would be with a huge budget and sure. a huge production team. And that's sometimes when I think about like the best music we've made or, you know, some of the best art we've made or, you know, concepts and ideas is when it's not, everything isn't just like handed to you. So you decided not to go to college. Um, I think, did you drop out? Yeah, I was at University of Illinois at Chicago. What did your parents think of that? I think that our mom was more of like the mad crazy artist, mm -hmm. so she understood where we were coming from. Our dad has more of a traditional background. He comes from Pakistan. He wanted you to go into engineering or something. At well, first. I wanted to go into engineering. Yeah. <laughs> but it was after our first big show in Chicago, Spring Awakening. He was front and center in the crowd, like jumping, going crazy the whole time. And I think after that, he got it. That wasn't the first time he saw you play, was it? Yeah, it was the first time he saw us play. Oh, really? Because mm -hmm. we had been playing like tiny little clubs and yeah. grungy, well, those like creepy bars. We're like, we do not want you to come to this <laughs> no, show. There are no, lots no. of boobies out. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about a little bit about being a woman in EDM. You guys are one of the few women in Vegas to be playing headlining sets. What is it like to be a woman in this industry? We were just playing Tomorrowland in Belgium and we're backstage and we really are the only females. I would say we're walking through a huge just gang of men and I don't feel like I'm a woman separate from these guys walking through. And I think that's an important mindset to have, to feel like you're on an evil, even playing field. But I also think it's important to recognize that there is still, um, you know, there are certain stereotypes. There are so many rumors that go around still. It's like if there's a woman that's successful, it's because this, this, and this reason she slept with this person or she bought her way into this rather than her just having talent. So I think it's really important to change our mindset and to talk about that so people become more open-minded to allow women to pursue their dreams because I think there's such a, there still is a stigma associated with being a woman in the industry and not only music but entertainment. I think that in itself pushes women away a lot of the time mm -hmm. and that's a huge problem. We need to change the dialogue to make it okay for p women to try the same exact things that men are. And I think in time you'll see an equal amount of women on these lineups. And you guys have experienced a lot of this kind of discrimination. Yeah, I'd say after um, the lawsuit that was filed against us last year, a little over a year ago from Chris, our former member, there was a lot of backlash. People went immediately into believing everything they read. They went into believing the headlines. So I think people immediately wanted to jump to these conclusions saying, of course, they're women. They use their sex to sell the group. Um, they manipulate men in the industry. They can't be trusted. And those were the constant themes that we kept seeing. And it seemed like people like kind of just jump on the ba bandwagon sure. and just latch on to what other people say. Even women, like you would see even women mm -hmm. running to that conclusion, which is the scary part that women can say those things about other women without thinking twice. They're part of the problem. And you have this megaphone of the internet that's essentially allowing people to project whatever they want to say behind computer screens. What is it like being kind of the center of that kind of abuse? I hate censorship of like how you're really feeling, mm -hmm. but when, when you break it down, what you're really saying, do you actually feel that way? Do you actually want to have that effect on the world? Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of these people, if they would take a step back and see what kind of influence they were having, I don't think they'd actually feel that way. So Jahan, I think you went on a social media hiatus for a while. Last year for right. nine months. I made it nine months. What was that like? I actually found myself abusing social media in the way where I felt addicted. Any opportunity to wait in line, be in a car, I would look at my phone, and I felt like I was not in the moment at all, not present. We owe the virtual world almost everything for our success because keeping in touch with fans, blasting out promotions of our shows and our music, that's been so 
in, it's so important to our careers, but at the same time, if you lose touch with reality, then your your music isn't going to be as good. Your your personality is going to suffer. Your mindset is going to become so ingrained in the internet. And living for this moment, for the present, is so much more important than all of that.